Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to all of you. Do we have any visitors this morning? Yes. Welcome. Welcome, welcome. Do we have any visitors in the hall, maybe? Welcome, too, if you're in the hall. And if you're home and visiting us for the first, first time, also welcome to this uh, church. We have uh, our speaker this morning is my brother Eduardo, or Ed. We give you a welcome. It's always a pleasure to um, have him in the front sharing the word. I have a couple of announcements for you this morning before we do the offerings and tithe. Number one, and more, more important, uh, Sister Wanda is asking for our prayers. Sister Wanda is a bit sick at the moment. She's not doing too good. And so she requested our prayers. So I ask you to please remember her through the day and through the week. And um, that would be appreciated. Also, um, what's, happen on what's happening on the 4th of July? Don't say Independence Day America, please. <laughs> we got Working Bee. All right, there's a Working Bee in our church, 4th of July, okay, Sunday. Come and celebrate Working Bee. Uh, as you know, we don't collect the offerings as we used to do anymore. Hopefully in the near future we will. But we have some boxes uh, in the outside in the back of the church with different labels, offering, tithes, stuff like that. So put, you can put your offerings and tithes as well in there. And also you can do it online, as you see in the, in the screen. Uh, I'll invite you now to bow your heads, and we're going to pray for those offerings that we have given or we're going to give. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity that we have to cooperate with you in uh, advancing the gospel to the world. We thank you as well that we can be faithful to you and bring what you requested from us, the tithes. And Lord, we ask you that you can help us to manage the rest of the money that we have the best way possible, Lord. Help us as well to um, give to other people in need and if, uh, as possible as we can, Lord. And help us as well to um, be able to reach the world with your message, Lord. Bless these offerings, bless these tithes that we bring to you. And those hands that are going to be uh, taking this money and managing this money, Lord, please uh, also give them wisdom and be with them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, our first uh, hymn this morning is number 338. 338, Redeem. We're going to sing together. Thank you. 
invite you, those who were able, to kneel down as we talk to God. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are here together to worship your name. We are here together, Lord, to let you know that we love you. And Lord, that we want to obey you and follow your commandments. As imperfect as we are, Lord, we are giving everything we have to you, Lord. And please accept it, mingle it with the works of Jesus, Lord, so that it can be perfect and wonderful to you. Lord, this morning we thank you for life. We thank you for health. And even though we are not perfect, Lord, we have our problems. Compared to the world, Lord, we are living very, very well. We thank you for such a blessing. But Lord, we also suffer. We have our sister Wanda that is not going through a, a good time at the moment. And whatever she's going through, Lord, she, she knows that she needs your, of our prayers, Lord. She needs you to heal her, to help her, Lord, if it's your will. So Lord, we ask you to please uh, listen to our prayers. That you, Lord, uh, have, have, have mercy on, on our sister I can help her to return to normal, Lord, as soon as possible. But Lord, ultimately, we ask you for your will to be done. Lord, also, we want to ask you for those of our members that are not here anymore. That after the, the beginning of the pandemic, Lord, they, they just stop coming. And we miss them, Lord. Not just that, but we know that you miss them as well to come to follow you, Lord. Please help them to, to be moved by the Holy Spirit, Lord, for them to, to reach out and to come and help us to also reach to them. Lord, forgive us for our sins, our mistakes, and anything that we have done. Perhaps we even forgot about it. Help us, O oh Lord, to remember and to ask for forgiveness as well, so that we can be in the right path with you, Lord. And this morning, as the message is going to be preached by our Brother Ed, we ask you that your Holy Spirit can take control of the sermon that the words can uh, penetrate our hearts and minds and that we can make decisions for, salva for our salvation today. Lord, help us through the working of your angels not to get distracted. Help the kids to be quiet and, and, and listening as well. And Lord, allow us all as a church to grow up spiritually, Lord, today. Bring us out of this place with a desire to share what we learn as well to others. And Lord, bless us for the rest of this Sabbath day. We ask you all of this, not deserving anything, but trusting in Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Is this working? Can you hear me? Yeah? That's good. So we're going to start with a um, children's story. And as per COVID regulations, we won't ask the kids to come to the front, so we're just going to ask you to stay where you are. So I want to share something that happened to me when I was little. If you ask my brother Andres, he probably say I was 18. But I called my mom yesterday to make sure it wasn't the case, so she said I was about eight years old when this happened. <laughs> I wasn't there. So I don't know if your mom and dad told you not to play with the PowerPoints. Yeah? because it's dangerous, isn't it? So one day I decided that I would outsmart my mom and dad, you know, because I was very clever for an 80-year-old boy. So I thought that if you introduce, you know, a little wire into one of those holes and you hold it, nothing will happen to you, you know, because you need the two of them to make things work. So I wanted to try my theory so I went to the bathroom and then I played with one of the PowerPoints. So I got one wire and I put it on that hole and I hold that wire, huh, nothing happened, I was right. So I decided I'm gonna get another wire, I'm gonna put it in the other hole. I'm just gonna hold it with the other hand, nothing happened. So my next step was to try to put them together, see what happened. And um, because I wasn't silly, 
<laughs> I use a toothbrush because I thought, you know, plastic doesn't conduct electricity, so nothing will happen to me. So I put them together and there was this big explosion. So I kind of like, I got blind for a couple of seconds and uh, there was a big noise. Of course, I ran out of that toilet, I think crying or something. And then my mom was like, what, what happened? And so I just told her what I did. And she just told me how lucky I was to be alive because I could have died, you know, like if I would have touched those two cables with my bare hands. So there was no power in the whole house. So my dad thought he could fix it going to the um, power box outside and try to fix those switches. And the thing is that the effect of what I've done didn't just burn the box outside, it did burn the, bo the big box outside, the one, the big transformer outside the house. So my dad had to call the electricity company to come and fix it. So I don't know how much money I had to pay for that, that, that day, so I'm sorry about that. And they had to fix the house as well. And then I asked my mom, so I don't remember you punishing, what, what was my punishment for that time? And she said to me, I, I think um, the scare you had that was enough for you, so we didn't give you any punishment. I think you learned your lesson that day. So, And um, we know a story in the Bible that talks about a young man that decided not to follow his father. He didn't want to obey his father, so he ran out of, away from his father. I'm pretty sure you heard about the story of the prodigal son, and you know how he ended up wasting his life in a faraway country, but he decided to go back to his father one day, and his father received him, and he didn't reproach him for what he did. I'm not gonna tell you more much about that because that's what we're gonna talk about this sermon, but what I want to leave with you is that you have a father in heaven that is waiting for you to come back to him, regardless of what you've done. And when you come back to him, he's not gonna tell you, I told you so, He's going to receive you with his arms wide open. So we're just going to finish with a little prayer. Just close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for being such a patient God, Lord, and for sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our sins. So one day, when we accept your sacrifice, Lord, you can forgive our sins, and you can work in our life to transform them, Lord. And when you come back very soon, we can go to heaven with you, and we can enjoy the time together with you, Lord. Please be with us the rest of this sermon and help us to listen and to be on our best behavior, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. We would like to invite our brothers to sing in the front again. We're going to sing hymn number 309, 309, I Surrender All.
Happy Sabbath again, brothers um, and sisters. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning to share a message with you. I have to be honest with you, it's, it's always a bit of a challenge for me to stand up here in front because I'm not really, I believe I'm not really good at talking in front of people, but I think God gives me the, um, the power to do it. So Amen. thank you for that. And it's also good for, for me to prepare. So it's, I'm talking to myself this morning as well. And I hope this message is, is good for you too. Just going to have a, a prayer before we start the sermon. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much again for the opportunity to be here together, Lord, so we can share some of your words. Lord, we ask you to please be with my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that your Holy Spirit can open their hearts and minds so the message can go where they have to go, Lord. And also help me, Lord, to, to say the right words as well. We ask you all this in your name we pray. Amen. So as, as we mentioned before, we're going to talk about the parable of the prodigal son. So if you open your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 15, and we're just going to start reading the first three verses. It says, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. They're talking about Jesus. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, These men receive sinners and eat with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, So we're going to stop here. The answer that Jesus gave to these Pharisees and scribes is, is a threefolded answer have like three different ways in which God deals with people who has once have a relationship with him and how he deals with that the first one is about the lost sheep you know the lost sheep um, he realizes he was lost but he didn't know how to go back to where he need to go and the second one is the parable about the lost coin which he didn't know he was lost and he needed to be found and the third one is the parable of the prodigal son, which he realized that he was lost, but he knew his way back. But he didn't realize, realize how much he needed from, from God, of his father in this case. So this is the parable we're going to talk about this morning. So we're going to jump to verses 11 to 13, to the parable of the prodigal son. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. We're just going to analyze these three verses. In the first one, verse 11, you can, say, you can see it says, a certain man had two sons. This is the kind of relationship God wants to have with us, a relationship of a father and son, or father and daughter. It doesn't say a certain man had two servants, 
or Satan men had two robots or two computers. He wants us to follow him by love. He doesn't want to impose um, his, his teachings to us. He's giving us something that's called free will. All right? And now we've seen the, the son asking the father, give me what is mine. Yeah? So he was probably tired of following his father, of being under the shadow of his father. And he probably thought that he knew better than him. Probably he thought, I don't need my father to tell me what to do. You know, I'm smart, I'm smart enough to do my own will. So his father's love and care for him was misunderstood. His father's protection was taken as restriction. And that is what Satan wants us to think about God and his commandment. I remember when, when I was at uni, um, back in Peru, uh, my friends would invite me to go to certain places where a, a Christian shouldn't be going to, or to drink certain drinks that a Christian should have been drinking. And I always say no, very politely, and eventually they will start asking why you not like this fun stuff. And I remember telling them, well, I am a Christian, and I believe that my body is a temple for God, I need to take care of my body, and I shouldn't be going to these places for this reason. Some of them understand, some of them would mock me, or some of them would get angry with me. And I, I remember saying, them saying something like, well, you're just missing out on all this fun, you know, you're wasting your young years, you know, when you get old and you uh, look back, you're going to say, how silly I was, you know, I should have gone with my friends doing this stuff. That's exactly what I thought. But if we look at Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, it says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. So, for someone who doesn't know God or who hasn't have God in their life, it will be coming as a restriction. But the law of God is not to restrict our life is to give us happiness. It's there for, for us to be happy, to live a happy life. So another thing that I would like to mention is that we as parents, we have a, a really big responsibility God has put on us. We have our kids and we need to teach them what's good and what's wrong. Not just with our words, but also with our actions. Because they're looking at us as an example. Um, in that parable of the prodigal son, this man had two sons. One decided to go, and the other one stay at home. So maybe I'm talking for someone who son or whose um, daughter decided to leave the church, and probably stop believing in God. And you might be thinking, where did I fail as a parent? Or what did I do wrong? I remember my dad telling me once I was grown up, I, I would ask him, Dad, what are you thinking? Should I be doing this or should I be going there? And he would tell me, well, son, I already told you. I told you what's wrong, what's good. So I leave it with you to decide. You know the answer. And most of the time I knew the answer, but still I would ask my father, you know. But I think as the Bible says in Proverbs 22, 22 verse 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when it's old, he will not depart from it. So if you are in that position that your son, your daughter is away from church, you cannot force them to come back but you can keep praying for them. You've done your work, you build a good foundation, and that seed is on their hearts. And all you can do is ask God to help them to come back to him. Let me ask you another question. Who is the best father in the whole universe? God? How many lost children does he have? Did he fail as a, as a father? No. He 
He was willing to come to live among us and to show us how to live a proper life. And not just that, he died on the cross for our sins. So when we surrender our life, he can transform us. And one day when he comes back, we can go to heaven with him. But he'll never force you to do something you don't want to do. So the young man, he was not interested in obeying his father. All he wanted was his father's money, isn't it? And unfortunately, many Christians nowadays, we can be like this prodigal son. We just want to receive all the blessing, but we don't want to follow and we don't want to obey God's commandments. We're going to read the book of Isaiah, chapter 4 and verse 1. And in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat our own food and wear our own clothes or apparel. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. You know, in the Bible, that women symbolizes the church. And then you have the, the husband and the man, that's, that's God. So in other words here, what, we, what we're looking at is a church telling God, look, we, we don't want the interpretation of the Bible as you want us to interpret it. We want to have our own interpretation of the Bible. We don't need your justification. We justificate ourselves. We just want to be called Christians, and that's it. And unfortunately, many churches are doing that, and we can be followed on the same mistake. Now, going back to our story of the prodigal son, we're going to keep reading the verses 14 to 16. And it says, But when he spent all, there arose a severe famine on, in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and journeyed himself to a citizen, sorry, joined himself to a citizen of the country, and he sent him into his fields to feed, to feed the swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pots that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Um, back when I was in Peru, I used to work in farming, and I, I, I used to work for this family. They have like five different farms, and one of these farms was next to a pig farm. And I remember the smell, it was just not nice. I know pigs are very nice animals, but they, they are a bit stinky, a bit dirty. Um, and this, this pig farm had like thousands of pigs. And the pig, the pig pen was made out of concrete. So that floor has to be washed weekly because all that pig poo and all the urine was building up in there. And then my boss had the great idea. I'm going to build a, a channel to go to that pig farm. So when they washed all that stuff, it will come and irrigate my farm. And he used to grow mandarins and oranges. Um, I'm pretty sure you guys know that we usually use cow or horse manure, not isn't it that but he wanted to save some dollars so that's what he do he did and I remember I would try to avoid going to that farm when I knew it was going to be irrigated sometimes I couldn't avoid it and when you walk through those uh, trees you have to be careful where you step in you don't, didn't want to step on that hooey water I guess we call it and there were so many flies around. It wasn't a nice, good experience to be around that farm. And I don't know if these clients knew how he used to grow his fruit. Probably no one will buy fruit from him. But it, this is just to give you an idea. How, how would you imagine living among pigs? You know, this young man was living among pigs. He was feeding them. He was probably having a long hair and and his beard was like not trimmed properly, he clothes probably all racked and stinking like pigs. And he was so hungry 
that he was also willing to eat from the pig's food. And you know, for a Jew, the worst animal, the most impure animal was a pig. Remember, God, Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. So that was exactly designed for them. So they would know that this poor man, he fell down to the lowest point he could have fallen down. So and, and while he was feeding the pigs, he remembered how the life back when he was with his father was. He had new clothes. He was eating good food. He was, didn't have to beg for food. He didn't have any worries. Have you ever been or are you far away from God at this point? Or have you been so low and so far away that you think there is no more hope for you? Well, let me tell you that it is not too late. And sometimes God allows us to experience the consequences of our own choices. Remember, we said that he gave us free will. He will not push you to do something you don't want to do. Some people say, you know, this is my life and I'll do with my life whatever I want to do. You know, just live and let live. And don't mess with me. This is what I want to do. This is my body. And I do with my body whatever I want to do with my body. Well, probably it's true that you can go wherever you want to go and eat whatever you want to eat or drink whatever you want to drink. But your body is not yours. And your life is not yours. The only reason why you are healthy and you are alive and you're sitting here this morning is because God allows you to be here this morning. And that's something that we have to have very clear. Proverbs 5.22. His own iniquities entrap the wicked men and he is caught in the courts of sin. You know, as we said before, God allows us to experience the consequences of our own acts. Sometimes our actions will entrap us. We will trap, we trap our own sins. This young man was trapped in his own sins, in his own misery. He was feeding pigs. And he felt that he was so low that he was thinking, I need to come back to my father, and I don't think he's going to accept me as his son anymore. So when I see him, I'm going to ask him to be a servant because I'm sick of eating or sick of being hungry and sick of desiring to eat this pig's food, you know? I need to go back. We found in the book of Christ Object Lessons the following in page 202. The love of God still yearns over the one who has chosen to separate from him. And he sets in operation influences to bring him back to the father's house. The prodigal son, in his wretchedness, came to himself. The deceptive power that Satan had exercised over him was broken. And he saw that his suffering was the result of his own folly. And he said, how many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father. And so it is the goodness of God that reaches us and that makes us understand our own condition. These young men realize how fall, how deep he had fall, and he needed his father. Also, repentance comes from God, and we see that in the book of Romans, chapter 2 and verse 4, or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? We don't even have the power for repentance. God is also reaching to us, helping us to realize our condition. So we can, we can repent and look for him. Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 3.
I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. It is the knowledge of God's love that brings us back to him. And it was that because of the love of his father towards this young man that he decided to go back to his father. Let's go back to our story again. Let's go to the book of Luke chapter 15. Verses 20 to 24. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. But let me ask you, did the young man, did the son went to the hairdressers before going to see his father and had a haircut and fixed his beard? Or, or did he went and have a shower and get new clothes before going to see his father? No. He went as he was. Filthy as he was. He went to see his father. And then, as we read there, the father saw him going a far way off. He ran towards him, and he went and called the servants and said, can you please give him a shower before I hug him because he stinks? Or can you please bring some new clothes for him? I can't hug him. He's, you know, he's, he's a mess. He doesn't say that. He received him as he was, and he gave him a big hug. He kissed him. And then he asked the servants to bring new clothes and new shoes and all this what I'm trying to say is that it doesn't matter how big your sins are or what you've done in your life, God is always willing to receive you back. And he's not going to tell you, I told you so. If you go away from me, this is going to happen. See, it's your fault. He's not doing that. He's running towards you and he's going to give you a hug. He's going to kiss you. He's going to receive you as you are. He's going to accept you. But it doesn't stay there. Once he receives you, then he transforms you. He's not going to leave you in your current situation. He's going to transform your life. But there's something that we have to have very clear. Sometimes that our sins bring up consequences. And even though God forgives us for our sins, we need to deal with the consequences of our sins. Let me give you an example. Remember the thief on the cross? He was sentenced to death because of his actions. And when he was, once he was next to Jesus on the cross, he realized that his life was worthless and that he needed a savior. So he asked Jesus to forgive him. And then he was forgiven, but he had to pay in this world for what he did. Or let's say that you used to be on drugs, or you destroy a family for your actions, but then you surrender your life to God. God forgives your sins, but there will be some consequences that you have to deal with during your life. But don't think for a minute that God is not forgiving you or that what you've done is too big that God cannot forgive you. So, remember how my, and the story that I have, um, my mom said she didn't punish me because I, you know, I learned my lesson. And usually when something, someone does something silly and they come and ask for help, it's because they know they've done something silly, isn't it? And you don't need to lecture them. What they need is some help. So I just want to make clear that 
It was the father who asked the servants to bring new clothes and new sandals. It, it wasn't the, the older brother. Yeah? So as older brothers in our church, if we see someone who is struggling, it is not our job to transform that patient, that patient, sorry, I'm talking about work now, that person, but it's our work to bring them back to Jesus. And once we do that, then he will take ch uh, charge and then he will transform them, he will convict them. It is not our work to do that, only have to bring them to Jesus. So uh, let me ask you again, how far have you gone away from God? That's a personal question. You can answer that to yourself. Whatever the answer is, let me tell you again, it's not too late to come back to him. If you ask my wife, um, she will tell you this is truth. Every time I drive, don't talk to me because I will miss the exit. Especially if I go through a runabout, even though it looks like it's very simple, if you start talking with me, I will definitely took the wrong, will take the wrong exit. So she, she learned that over the years, She's, she won't take, talk to me when I'm driving for that reason because I get into like auto mode and I don't know. It doesn't work with me. But if that happens, it's very easy to fix it. Because once you realize that you missed your exit or you took a wrong turn, all you have to do is make a U-turn and go back to where you should go. If we put that into our spiritual walking, you maybe have been walking for a long distance on the wrong direction and God makes you realize that you have to come back, you have to do a U-turn. Let's say that you have walked 20 kilometers away from where you should have been walking, and then you realize that you've been walking in the wrong direction, that you have to make a U-turn. But the good news is that the way back is shorter than the way going far away. Why, you should ask? Because of this here. Luke 15, 20. He says, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. So, can you imagine in the story of the prodigal son, probably the father was on the porch, sitting on the porch, looking for the son to come. You know, once I come, I'm going to tell him off. You know, and then he sees him going far away and then he's just waiting for him to go all the way to him. No, it, that wasn't the case. When he saw him far away, he ran towards him to receive him. And that's the same with us. Once we decide that we're going to surrender our life to God because we've been walking in the wrong direction, straight away he runs towards you and he meets you halfway and he receives you with arms wide open. Amen. Christ Objects Lessons, again, page 206. Arise and go to your father. He will meet you a great way off if you take even one step toward him in repentance, he will hasten to enfold you in his arms of infinite love. His ear is open to the cry of the contrite soul. The very first reaching out of the heart after God is known to him. Never a prayer is offered, however faltering. Never a tear is shed, however secret. Never a sincere desire after God is cherished however feeble, but the Spirit of God goes forth to meet it. Even before the prayer is uttered or the yearning of the heart made known, grace from Christ goes forth to meet the grace that is working upon the human soul. So even as you realize that you're lost and you decide to go back, God starts working straight away. Even when you start a prayer asking God, to help you to change your life, he's working already, even before you finish your pray. Isn't that Amen. awesome? Amen. I just want to leave you with one more verse. It's in the book of Micah, 
chapter 2 and verse 10. He says, Arise and depart, for this is not your resting place, because of uncleanness that destroys. Micah chapter 2, verse 10. Uh, brothers and sisters, I just want to let you know that is my hope today that if you feel that you've walked away from God and that your life is full of sin and you feel dirty because you're covered with sin, don't try to fix your life yourself. We don't have that power in ourselves. You need to go and look for, for God. Surrender your life to Him and He will transform your life. So today is the day when we need to arise and go to our Father. That's my will. That's my hope for this morning. It's not too late. And we're going to finish um, singing hymn number 289. The Savior is waiting. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much again for your patience, Lord. We know you are knocking at the doors of our heart. You want to come in, Lord, and you want to transform our lives for better, Lord. Please help us to surrender to you, Lord. Um, help us to understand that you want the best for us, and even though we feel like there's no hope for us, or we might think that we've been so far away that it's too late for us to come back. Lord, help us to believe in your promise, Lord, that if we ask you to help us and if we surrender, Lord, you will run towards us and you will help us in that second, Lord. We ask you to please um, work on our hearts and if we have made any decision today, Lord, help us to follow. And we ask you for our brothers and sisters that 
not here today, Lord, that you can be with them, Lord, today as well. And we ask you all of this in your precious name we pray. Amen.